<laughs> well, howdy. Welcome back to Adventure in Art. My name is Ben Staley. This episode is going to be a Q&A, focusing mostly on a nine-part series that I just uh, last week launched the last chapter. So maybe you saw some of it, maybe you didn't. Uh, let me give you a little background. I, late last year, after finishing up a remote project, I came back to LA and in a, the space of about 10 days to two weeks, I did nine different photo shoots with nine different models, sh all shot on film. And uh, I did it pretty rapidly. I think I did the last one just before Thanksgiving. It was literally in a space of less than two weeks. And then I slowly released those over the next three months, uh, starting around the first of the year. Uh, why did I do this? Because I knew I was going to be traveling for work. I wasn't going to be around. I wasn't going to be able to make videos all the time. And I just wanted to keep the channel kind of current, you know. Um, I try really hard to release videos regularly. Sometimes I, <laughs> sometimes I wonder why I'm doing it. I'm not really seeing the big returns, um, kind of playing the long game though. And I enjoy it. The truth is, if I didn't enjoy it, I'd freaking quit. But uh, I do enjoy it. And I am doing photo shoots all the time. So why not film them? Why not bring you along? Why not show you? I do what I can, okay? So anyways, that's the long intro. I put out a call for questions uh, relating to this series, and that's mostly what I got, although there's some other stuff in there too, and uh, we're going we're gonna to unpack it. I got, uh, I, got a few an I got a few questions, and uh, enough, I think, to make for a full video. I was actually thinking there would be more. I think last time I put out a call for questions, uh, I got more, but you know, whatever. Who knows? I don't know how this stuff works. So. I'm blabbing. Let's get into it before this gets really long. So I've got them all on my phone here. So just, uh, I'm not surfing the web. I'm not on social media. I'm reading the questions. Okay, let's just start. I think there's uh, 10 or 12 here. First one <laughs> from Alex Boldia. <laughs> Alex is a model and an actress. She, she's a subject of one of the episodes that I just mentioned. Alex Boldia, not a question. Just a F yeah, F yeah, Alex, you rock. I'm gonna photograph Alex again here in the next week or so. We've already talked about it. Alex is awesome. Okay, next one from Torberg. Uh, hello with the badass name Torberg. I don't shoot film, Q2 monochrome, sweet. But I really love the format of your latest series, small talk behind the scenes and real photography in focus, thanks. Okay, yeah, you're welcome, Tor. Um, yeah, I like doing that too. Adam Adamo, I don't know, this is a username off of, uh, off of Instagram, I think. Adam Apolos, I'm just gonna say Adam. Do I need to say the names? I like to give credit. Okay, uh, Adam wants to know SLR versus rangefinder for portraits, your approach in each system and which one do you prefer? That is a good question. Okay, um, and I've talked about this a little bit in actually one of the videos, maybe a couple of them. I talk about this a fair amount. Rangefinders and SLRs are different, right? With an SLR, and dang, you know, I meant to bring my, have my cameras handy so I could show you. Should I go get them? No, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. Um, We'll just talk about it. With an SLR, it's called single lens reflex, okay? Reflex. And I think the reflex, I should I should research. I think the reflex means that it's like, that's talking about the mirror that goes up and down. But you're actually, when you're looking through the viewfinder, you're looking right through the lens. You see exactly what's gonna be recorded, exactly how it's gonna be recorded. You're whoop, looking right through. With a rangefinder, here's the lens, here's the lens. You're looking through a little hole over here. So you're not seeing exactly, you're not looking through the lens. 
you're, you have this little rangefinder patch and you're, you're lining that up to focus. So it's totally different. Um, my approach to each system and which one do I prefer? Okay, okay, broad strokes, my favorite camera of all time is my rangefinder, my Leica M6. And uh, I've talked about that a lot. I love that camera. It's, it's a camera I'll have till the day I die. I love it largely for personal reasons, but I love shooting with it too. Now, I've shot some, some of my favorite portraits of all time with that camera, but, but it's not my favorite camera for portraits because the kind of portraits I like to take are really close and I like that shallow depth of field. I like that critical focus on the subject's eyes, usually. I like that real soft background. Those things are hard to achieve with a rangefinder, okay? And I've talked about this in a lot of videos. Maybe you understand. So that's why I got my Nikon F4. Uh, and I have a portrait lens on there, 105 millimeter, super sick portrait lens that I use for my film portraits. So if I'm gonna go do a film portrait session with someone, typically, sometimes I'll shoot with my M6 because I love it and I get great results with it most of the time. But I tend to prefer the look of my Nikon F4 more. I hope that answers it without getting super long-winded and into the weeds. Maybe I could do a video about this and I'll just compare. I mean, maybe, I don't know, that kind of stuff doesn't sound so fun to me, but if that's something you wanna see, leave a comment and let me know. If there's anything you wanna see that you're not seeing or you wanna know more about at the end of this video, leave me a comment and let me know what that is. We'll just keep this talk going. Okay, next question. Gear question, UV filters necessary or not? Oh, by the way, and I kind of divided these up. You know, the first half are like all kind of gear sorted. The second half are more like dealing with people and that kind of thing, just so you know. I should have said that at the beginning. I'm not very good at this. I'm moving right along. From John Statine, gear question, UV filters necessary or not? Uh, when I'm doing professional video work, I always have a UV filter on the lens of my video camera. Um, because there's stuff flying around and the kind of work I do is typically in kind of full-on, oftentimes dangerous environments. So you gotta protect the lens. And uh, I've destroyed lenses before. <laughs> Too close to some welding sparks, that kind of thing. Whoops. I've destroyed filters a lot more than lenses, right? So having said that, uh, on my Nikon film setup, I bought all my lenses from one guy and uh, they came, they were brand new, basically. They were hardly ever used and they came with UV filters. So there's UV filters on those. There's UV filters on the video camera I'm using. On my Leica setups, my M6 and my Q2, I don't have UV filters on the lenses. So I'm sort of, I'm sort of flying without a seatbelt, so to speak. Um, is it risky? Yeah, maybe. Sometimes I do use filters, um, polarizing filter or a red filter for the film or whatever, but I don't have a UV filter, protective filter on there, and I take those cameras into some gnarly stuff. Um, have I gotten away with it so far? Yeah. The, the, the front end of the lenses, those Leica lenses, they're pretty tough. They've got coatings on them. Maybe I'll get burned. I'm definitely not getting close to like flying dangerous sharp objects. I try not to, although my Q2 has been abused heavily and I was involved in like a off-road vehicle accident with it where I it, we flipped over and the thing got buried in the sand and it's dented because of that. But uh, I don't have a filter on it. Yeah, it's your call. On, on, those, uh, on that subject, some photographers think, well, you know, anything you put in front of the lens will affect the image, even if it's a clear UV filter. Um, I think no one on this planet's gonna really see the difference. I'm certainly not. I'm not one of those guys that doesn't put a filter on just because I think it might degrade the image. Now, clearly, I think the Leica lenses that I have are, and the lenses that they make are the best lenses on the planet, but uh, I don't have a filter on them. Hope that answers the question. Pablo. Pablo. Oliviero, I think. Type of continuous lighting you use in outdoors. Uh, in the last video series, I used some continuous lighting in three different videos. I was doing this, I was kind of, I'm on kind of on this red kick 
and I have this set of uh, Nanlite Pavo tubes. They're 15 inch, you know, 15 inch or so um, LED tubes. They're freaking awesome. They have internal batteries. Um, they have all kinds of different settings. You can change the color temperature, the color blue, red, green. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can make it strobe. The batteries last a long time. They have an app. You can sync it all up. I haven't really done that yet. I'm going to be doing more with these and more with film with these, uh, these lights. I haven't really gotten around to it yet, but that's what I used in the last series of videos for my continuous lighting. Um, I'm more comfortable with continuous lighting because of my background as a filmmaker and as a cinematographer. I use continuous lighting all the time to shoot interviews and to light scenes. I'm using strobe light more and more for my digital photography um, and I really like it and I like what I have been doing. And I've been doing a lot of that lately. Um, but uh, I'm not as comfortable with it. Like I'm, I'm futzing around with it a little more. Um, I'm more comfortable because of years of doing video and filmmaking with continuous lighting and you kind of, what you see is what you get and kind of tweaking it that way. Um, anyways, Nanlite Pavo tubes, uh, fairly reasonably priced, and uh, that's what I've been using. How do you do the lighting for the really dark portraits? Okay, I mean, that's kind of a general question. Thanks, Joe. Um, how do I do the lighting? Well, sometimes it's, sometimes it's with continuous lighting, sometimes with strobe lighting, sometimes with natural lighting. I typically like darker styled portraits. So I'm trying to, if it's natural light, position my model in a place where the light is maybe um, kind of deflected light, indirect light, um, provides that kind of darker, softer look, which I like. Um, if I'm using a strobe, I've been using, doing dark portraity type editorial shots with a with a strobe and a, uh, a big like five foot umbrella on my, with my Q2. I've been doing, that's the, what I've been doing lately and I haven't really been filming them for videos but I've been doing a lot of photo shoots lately and I'm gonna continue doing that and I, cause I really like the look. Um, here's a few recent shots that I've done that I really like. But you know, it's just about, it's about the quality of the light. Do you want harsh direct light? Do you want a soft diffused light that's, that's maybe sort of indirect? And then it's just about tweaking your settings and, and uh, you know, making the power of the light um, what you want it to be. I don't really know how to answer this question uh, technically. It's just like I, I do spend a lot of time, what I'm trying to achieve usually with portraiture and with the photography is, is that, that balance of light and dark and the contrast. And I like a... I like a contrasty image. I like a darker than normal image. Those are, that's what is sort of pleasing to me. So does that help? If, if, if there's any more specifics or anything you want to know or more, you want to know more about, just ask me in the comments, please. Um, these are tough questions for me to ask. How do I do it? Um, I sort of futz around with it. I move the model around. I move the light around. I adjust the levels till I get it looking like I want it to look. Um, and I guess if you're looking to kind of do what I'm doing and do the same kind of thing, you know, more than just having me, give me a sip of coffee, more than just having me kind of tell you what to do, you should take a screenshot, go out and try and achieve that and futz around with it till you get it kind of right. Um, that's what I'd recommend. And that's what, that's what I really do. And I've done it so much that I kind of know, know where to put people. I know where to put the light. I know how to adjust it. But you got to just do it. You can't have me or somebody else on the internet or on YouTube telling you what to do. You got you to gotta think about it. You got to notice the light. And then you got to just tweak the settings till you get it how you want it to get. That's really what it's going to take. That's how you're going to learn. Not by me telling you. Mm, focus, focus, focus. Um, next question. Jason Blake. Would love to know your metering methods for your portraits, particularly the high contrast black and white shots. There we go again. Many thanks. Your videos are forever inspirational. Oh, thanks for that, Jason. Would love to know your metering method. Okay, so for, with film. Um, 
My M6 has an internal meter. So I usually, um, I go by that meter and I think it's a center weighted meter, which means it kind of takes what's in the middle and then it kind of averages that out. Um, so particularly when I'm in a high contrast place, um, I'll typically take a reading in the brightest spot. And sometimes I'll hold the camera close to the subject or on their face. Sometimes I'll get the whole thing. I've done it enough now where I can, I can take a reading and then I'll look at it and I understand. I, I kind of, I guesstimate, and I like this part of it. I guesstimate, I look at the shadows, I look at the highlights, and then I'll be like, okay, I want this a little darker, so maybe I'll, I'll drop it a stop or two stops. Or I want it brighter, I'll up a stop. I don't do that very often, but uh, typically I'm adjusting darker. Um, occasionally, occasionally I will take a reading with a digital camera, like with my Q2, and click, okay, that's kind of the balance I want. I'm previewing the image in black and white or whatever, and then, I, and then I'll duplicate those settings on the digital camera. Honestly, though, I probably do that 2% of the time. And I've done it sometimes when I'm using, when I was using like the nan lights, the Pablo tubes and stuff, I was a little unsure at first with those and especially with the color and getting the balance right. And I still haven't nailed it. I, I actually want to dive back into that and try and, I don't think I've actually consistently nailed exposure with that. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm still learning, um, particularly with the color photography, but I know this question was about the black and white. Um, when I'm using my Nikon F4, the cool thing about that is it has aperture priority. And I have almost, well, I did the other day, I did a, a few exposures manually the other day because I was in super bright sunlight and I wanted to make it darker, I thought, than it would meter on its own. But uh, typically with that camera, almost exclusively, and it's the reason I got it, one of the main reasons, is it shoots an aperture priority. So I just put it on an aperture priority. I open the stop, the, the lens, all the way and I just fire away. Now I've gotten burned a couple times and I feel like it's overexposed. So I've learned that when I'm in a brighter area, I'm typically, what I'll do is I just tweak the exposure compensation down a stop or sometimes two stops. And I've been doing that more because I've noticed some of the shots that I've done to my eye have been a little overexposed. But overall the meter um, on that F4 is freaking awesome. So it's great. I'm gonna, I think I might do a whole video about that camera because I, I really love it. It's not an everyday camera. I'm never gonna pack it around and have that as like my camera for the day to shoot. But when I'm shooting people, I love it. I hope that answers your question, Jason. Nick. Okay, Nick. <laughs> Nick had, Nick had, uh, gotten in there and asked me like, okay, what's your process for shooting portraits or something like that? Some big general question. And I was like, I, I wrote back to him and I'm like, dude, that's, that's really big. Just ask me a couple of specifics and I'll try and, uh, I'll try and narrow in on those. So Nick says, want to know the way you use light, your light setup from what I saw is something simple, but still something magical in your portraits. That's the main question. Okay. The second one is more related to the camera, how you manage to portray with the 28 millimeter. It's not the less best lens for portraits, they used to say. Thanks for the questions, Nick. Those are still pretty big and broad, but the way you use light. I sort of talked about that already. Um, I like a darker portrait. I like indirect lighting. I, I like it from the side, kind of, although sometimes I'll do direct frontal light, but not as much. I don't like when I'm using artificial light, continuous or strobe lighting. I don't like, especially with strobe, I'm only using one light when I'm using strobe lighting with my Q2. Um, I don't like big complicated setups. Now with continuous lighting, I will bring in more lights, one, two, three sometimes, sometimes for a backlight or an edge light or whatever, but uh, rarely. If I'm shooting film with light, um, and honestly, it's not, it's not that I don't know how, because for video and filmmaking, I'm using, oftentimes using many lights, sometimes a dozen different lights if you're lighting a whole set. But uh, if I'm doing portraits and I'm trying to capture someone, I don't wanna be, my dog is sniffing the camera monitor right now. I don't know if you can hear that, 
but she's getting restless. Uh, anyways, back to uh, squirrel, squirrel. Um, I, I'm trying to make things for myself and for my subject as simple as possible. So one light, maybe two lights, really simple setup, um, soft, indirect, something that, uh, I, I like to really light a bigger space. I don't want to have to confine the subject too much. I want to be able to move. I want them to be able to move around a little bit. I want myself to be able to move around a little bit. Does that answer the question, Nick? If it didn't, feel free to specify more in the comments and I will try really hard to get into that. And if, if this is the kind of stuff you guys really want to know about, I'll do more videos on it. It's like, um, I will really try and do that, but uh, just let me know. I'm mostly making videos about stuff I want to do and what I want to talk about. If there's something else you guys really want to see, I'm down to do that. That's fine. Second half of the question, how do you manage to portray with the 28 millimeter? Okay, my Q2, um, haven't done a Q2 video in a long time. Actually, after this, I think, it's going to be the next one or the one after that, I'm going to do another, it's going to be called More Portraits with a Leica Q2 because one of the very most popular videos of all time on my channel is portraits with the Leica Q2. So I'm going to do another comprehensive video about shooting portraits with 28 millimeter Leica Q2 because it's been over a year and a half since I made that video and I've shot literally hundreds of people since then. So documentary portraits, uh, model portraits, all kinds of stuff, action. So that's coming up and I'm going to talk more about that. Um, with 28 millimeter for portraits, you know, in broad strokes, spoiler alert, you know, you really have to pay attention to the angle and the size. And I feel like this, these mid range kind of knees, cowboy up that size of portrait to full body. Those are the size of portraits that work best with a 28 millimeter. Although there are some angles you can do close up where you can shoot close face shots. And I've done that. And some of the stuff I did in Africa and some other places I've shot close ups with the 28 millimeter and, it, and achieved portraits that I really like. So, but you have to pay really close attention to camera angle and framing and that sort of thing. Those like a 28 millimeter lenses are freaking unreal. I hope that answers your question, buddy. Joa. We need the backstory to the M6. You know, I'm going to check and make sure my camera's still recording. Still here, still here. We need the backstory for the M6. Uh, I've actually made a whole video about the backstory of the M6 or the M6 in general, which I'm going to put the link. Um, bing? Oh, is it going to end up there? I think so. Bing! Where I, I tell that story. The story's also been told in written form and in a podcast, the camera was given to me by my friend Mark Twight, who's a bit of a legendary mountain climber and, and legendary for some other things too. You look up Mark Twight. But he's a friend of mine and he, he gave me the camera. And we, Mark has a podcast. I'm going to put that down in the link. It's called the Nonprofit Podcast. And I was, I've been on there several times, but the, the first time I was on there, we talked a little bit about the camera and that. And then Mark, if you look around his nonprofit website, I know early on he did write some stuff about giving me the camera. That's it. It was given to me by Mark Twight. It was a fantastic, unbelievable act of generosity. And that's why the camera means so much to me. And I freaking love it. So, Iodo-san. Ooh, I like that name. Iodo-san. Japanese? Documentary slash portraits photo project film with the risk of having missed the shot or digital? Great question, Iodo-san. You know, I would love, I would love to do an extended documentary portrait project with my M6. I would love that. I would love to go into like a heated environment, a, a conflict environment and do portraits there. I would love to tour with a, like a band and do uh, tour photos with the M6, sort of gritty documentary style portraiture behind the scenes. That's something I, that's something I actually really want to do. You're going to miss some shots with the, with the film versus the digital. 
the Q2 would also be freaking amazing for that. I mean, it's, it's built for that. It really is that kind of, you know, camera for reportage or documentary work. That's why guys like Greg Williams are, you know, backstage at the Oscars and these award shows, and he's shooting almost exclusively a Q2, all these celebrities and stuff. It's so great for that, really candid documentary style portraiture. It's amazing. It's an amazing camera for that. Actually, I think, you know, the Q2 and the M6 are really great complements to each other. I would love to go do an extended tour or, you know, drop into a hot zone somewhere and do some documentary portraiture, film and digital. Um, if I had to choose one, which one would I take nowadays? If I had to and I had to deliver, I'd take the Q2. Because, uh, I mean, you're right, I'd have to take... Well, it, it really depends. Okay, okay, Iro-san. Iro-san. Uh, it depends on where I'm going, okay? If I'm going off grid somewhere really remote and I can't charge my batteries for a long time, I'm going to take my M6 because I can use that damn thing without even without a battery in it. I don't even need the meter in it. Like, it, it still works. So I could take a bag full of film, and I could shoot for a long time. I'd take a 35 millimeter lens and a bag of film and go rock it out for weeks if I had to, in the middle of the desert, in the Amazon jungle, wherever. I would do that. That's the camera I would take. If I could charge my batteries every day and bada bing, bada boom, I'd take the Q2. Oh, I want to do that so much. I make my living doing filmmaking and documentary filmmaking work. But I would love to be paid to do a long-form documentary photo project. Unfortunately, that work doesn't really exist uh, mostly. There are some people doing it, but uh, it's a tough thing to get into. Okay, moving on, we're kind of done with the we're kind of done with the uh, coffee, the uh, technical aspect of things. Kevlar negative, cool username. How do you approach models or do they get in touch with you? I'd like to shoot more people, but anxiety got me pinned down. Um, there's two questions along this line. And then there's another one from Pascal Gauch. Hi, Ben. First of all, congrats on the great series. Faces on film, as usual, coming from you. Very inspiring content. Thanks, dude. Question, how do you convince models that you never met before to do these types of shoots without any security on the results, uh, showing your portfolio, question mark, or just going on an adventure with all the uncertainties. Quite a challenge. Cheers from Switzerland. Two questions there in the same vein. How do you approach models? You guys should watch my video, uh, the story of my studio, because I talk about how I got into shooting portraits and shooting models and how I started. Bing! Spoiler alert. I started shooting my friends and I travel a lot for work. I was doing filmmaking, doing, doing documentary stuff. And so I'm always around different people and I started just shooting them. And then I built up a little bit of a portfolio. I started shooting my friends. I live in Los Angeles, basically. And uh, I, know a lot of, I know a lot of actors and models and creative people. And so I started shooting them just like my friends. And then people started asking me, or if I saw someone interesting, I would ask them. And then it just sort of built from that. And now. You know, I, I will meet people on social media. Um, one of us will broach the question oftentimes. Um, sometimes people ask me, sometimes I ask them. I'll photograph almost anybody if I think they're interesting and I think it's worthwhile. My studio, if you've seen that, here, here's a little, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess something here. I don't know if I've talked about that. I tell my friends this, but uh, my studio that you've seen in a lot of these videos, you know, it's, it's in Santa Clarita, which is like 30 miles north of downtown LA. So with traffic and everything, it's a bit of a drive. Typically, if someone, if someone really wants to shoot, I will suggest that as the first spot. Now, I will 90% of the time, if I'm home and I'm not working, and this is someone I want to shoot, I'll just shoot them. I'm not, I'm not doing this stuff for money. I'm doing it for fun. So... It's a free photo shoot for them. The catch is they have to get their ass in a car and drive out to my studio. Some people are not willing to do this. Some people are. So it's in a safe spot. It's next to like a little strip mall. Your cell phone works. Um, I always tell everybody, hey, bring a friend. It's a drive out there. You can bring a friend. I'm not trying to get any models alone. I'm not trying to be creepy. Just be, be 
have safety first, be respectful, let's high five, let's have fun, let's take some cool pictures. But uh, you're gonna get great pictures. You're gonna get them for free. All you gotta do is get in the car and drive. And you know, I've had real professional actors and, and models and people come out and be willing to do that. Some of them at like five, six in the morning when the light's amazing. So, and then some people who are just like, no, I don't wanna work that hard to do that. Why don't you just come into downtown LA and we'll shoot there? No, I don't really wanna do that. That's my story. Next question, what, what do you look for to make sure you don't waste a shot or your subject's time? Well, I don't wanna waste my time, <laughs> first of all. I don't wanna waste anybody else's time either, especially if they've driven 45 minutes or an hour out to where my studio is. So I pay attention. I know how to use the light there. Um, I focus on what I'm doing. Having said that, I do like to take chances. I do like to take risks. I do like to um, experiment. So it's a mix of both. I do things where it's, especially with film, where I know it's a sure thing and I know what I'm gonna get. Every shoot I do, I'm also trying to learn a little bit. I'm trying to push things. I'm trying to do something I've never done before. So it's a mix. Impressed by the authenticity, how do you encourage that natural comfort? One second. If you've seen any of my videos on portraiture, I've said this over and over, look, the natural comfort is the key. It's not your camera, it's not your lens, it's how you interact with the people you're trying to photograph. It's this, it's this mood, this vibe that you create. How do I encourage that? Did you hear that? The dog is back there drinking. We'll just give her a minute. Okay, thanks for that, Zoe. Okay. Um, how do I encourage that natural comfort? It's key, it's everything. So first of all, I just try and be real authentic. I try and be genuinely, because I am genuinely interested in people. People are freaking interesting, okay? I ask people a lot of questions. I try and get to know them. I try and just be normal, even if, even if I'm nervous, which sometimes I am. Like we, you know, you're, you might've done something a thousand times. Sometimes you're a little nervous. If I haven't shot anybody in a long time, I am typically, a little rusty or a little nervous. If you're not a little nervous, if you're not a little heightened, you're taking it too casually and you're probably gonna take crappy pictures. You should be a little on edge. You should be a little bit worried that maybe something will go wrong. Maybe you won't do your best job. You need that tension, but you can't let that inform the mood. You just have to feel that and then you have to project confidence safety, warmth, um, a good collaborative, creative, fun spirit. I like to have fun. If it's not a job, I don't want it to feel like work. I wanna be high-fiving, I wanna be laughing, I wanna be having fun. Um, particularly if it's a female subject, I want them to feel safe. I tell them ahead of time, particularly if I'm shooting in a more remote location, um, or just not in a studio or right in the city, bring a friend, always bring a friend, bring a, bring, bring a pal, bring your boyfriend, bring your dad, bring your uncle, bring your cousin. When they get there and I try and just lay out the challenges, where we're going, what we're doing, I try and let them know that their safety is paramount to me because it is, that's it. And then it's just like, just, just be genuine. Don't be creepy. If you feel awkward, if, if you really are afraid, don't be paralyzed by it. I don't want, I hate that term, fake it till you make it, but fake it a little bit. Try and project, try and just project an air of confidence and creativity and fun as best you can. And uh, treat people with respect, be kind to them. And uh, that's just sort of everyday life advice anyways. Nico Presley. <laughs> Nico's an actress and a model, and I photographed her in my studio before, and so she asked a question. Right on, Nico, right on. What did you learn from the experience? The experience of the last nine videos of, of Faces on Film, that little series, what did I learn? I learned that it's fun to do a series like that in a, in a small amount of time and then stretch them out. I like that mode. I like that way of working. What did I learn from actually doing the work? I think that'd be a better question to answer. 
I tried to try things that I had never done before. I learned that I really loved that Nikon F4 camera because I used it more than I ever had before. And that 105 millimeter lens. I learned the sweet spot of that, that lens and that camera. I learned that I really do love, 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 love shooting portraits of people. I love the interaction. I love the interplay. Um, I love shooting film because the outcome is not guaranteed. It's not even known. You know, there were things that I, mistakes I made and things I screwed up that I wish I hadn't. There was also things that came out better than I could have dreamed. So I reinforced and learned that I really love doing that. That's a, that's a good question, Nico. I hope I answered that well. Last, last, last from Blossom Bay, AKA Daisy from England. Daisy is a film shooter, fantastic film shooter from England. She gets the last question. Daisy wants to know which artists slash photographers have you been inspired by lately? I have followed on social media, um, Twitter and on Instagram, a ton of photojournalists who have been covering the conflict in Ukraine, the war that uh, Russia has waged against the nation of Ukraine and its people. And there's a lot of incredible journalists over there um, shooting video, shooting stills, writing stories on the front lines. Um, some of them have been injured. A few of them have been killed. I'm following quite a few of them on Instagram. And uh, there's people over there doing incredible work in incredibly difficult conditions. If you haven't been to war, you probably can't understand it. I haven't been to war. I can't really understand it. I've been in some really, really dicey situations in my, in my documentary video work. I've watched people die right in front of me from gunshot wounds. I've seen horrible things. It's still, I know very plainly that it, my experiences pale in comparison to what those men and women are doing over there, what they're capturing, what they're living through, what they're witnessing every day. And I, the, some of the things I've seen have still to this day haunt me. I have images burned in, into my brain that I see every day because they're never going to leave my consciousness. They were so horrible. But imagine, imagine living through that day after day, week after week. We're what, five weeks into the, into the war now or six weeks. And pe some people have been there since the beginning. Incredible. I'm inspired. And listen, if, if those people aren't there doing that work, risking their lives, side by side with the soldiers, with the civilians, getting shelled, getting shot at. If they're not there doing that work, bringing back those images, we're never gonna have seen it. That those, those the, the real visceral horror of what that is, it's, it's gonna be an abstract concept to us. But thanks to the journalists that are there, photojournalists, video journalists, um, writers. Thanks to them, we're able to get a, a glimpse into the horror of what that is and see the real cost of that. It's not an abstract thing. So I think it's one of the most important jobs in modern or any, any culture, any society. These people that will go into the fray, into the front lines, into the worst of the worst, the worst examples of human behavior, war, men and women killing each other, horrible things. And these people will march right into that, and put their own lives on the line to capture those images and bring them back to us. I'm just, uh, I'm in awe of it. I'm in awe of what I see every day from these people. 
what the Ukrainians are having to live through right now, what they're having to deal with. It's, it's, it's unimaginable. <sighs> Those are the people that are really inspiring me right now, artist-wise, photography-wise. I'm inspired by the courage and the resilience and the, the sheer tenacity and the will to fight that the Ukrainian people are demonstrating on a national stage. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable to think and, and to imagine what that must be like. Here we are in 2022 and this modern world and these people's whole lives are just being decimated. <sighs> I'm inspired. I'm inspired by what I'm seeing from those people surviving through it, capturing it, recording it. Thanks. That was a great question, Blossom. Daisy. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. Thanks for everyone that offered questions. Um, if there's something that you want to know, leave it in the comment. I'm going to try and be doing more of these kind of videos where I just talk. Um, Honestly, they're a lot easier. I can get them out a lot quicker. Typically, in most of the videos I'm doing, it's like I'm out doing a shoot or doing stuff and trying to... Then I, it, they, they take a lot of editing. They take a lot more time. I can sit down and have a conversation with you guys and put something out much quicker and much easier. I'm really trying to focus on doing projects right now that are going to put me in, in a place that uh, I want to be. Making films, making the kind of documentaries I want to make photography projects. There's some pretty good stuff coming, I think. I'm excited to make and to show you guys. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for showing up and staying until the end. <laughs> Get out there, have an adventure, go exploring, go find a part of town you've never been to, go park down some street, get out, walk around for a couple hours with one little camera and one little lens, see what you find. Maybe just sit in a street corner and watch for a while. Who knows what you're going to see? Put yourself out there. Go make some art. Go put yourself on the line. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again soon.